Welcome to The Storytellers, the radio show and podcast that features those who choose to leave their mark on the world through the art of story. I'm your host, Grace Salmon. I look forward to our time together today. Now, let's meet our storyteller. Hello, and welcome to The Storytellers. Thea Sutton has a PhD in English literature and books and articles to her credit. She has worked in marketing and communications, and she divides her time between Toronto and Southern California. I'm very excited today to welcome to the Storyteller Microphone, an author who is enigmatic and perhaps as elusive as some of her characters. Thea, <laughs> welcome, welcome to the microphone. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, thank you for that introduction. And I wanna say thank you so much for creating this space for storytellers, for authors, for readers to come together. I think it's marvelous. Thank you so much. I'm really enjoying it. I think we're 25 episodes in, and it's been an experience that has been very much a surprise. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to the microphone. So tell us about your amazing book, The, welcome, the Women of Blackmouth Street. The Women of Blackmouth Street is set in 1890s London, and there are some background uh, pieces of the story that are set in Boston. It's, a, it's an age that is compelling, lots of change, and with that change comes push and pull, these historical forces. It's really the birth of the modern age in terms of uh, science, what we were learning at the time and how that changed society, major wealth disparity between, of course, the incredibly wealthy and the poor. It was not ca called the Gilded Age for nothing. And we could get back to that a little bit. Incredible changes in terms of the status of women, which I think also the Women of Blackman Street explores. So into that heady brew, I put our protagonist, Georgia Buchanan, she is a Boston heiress with a lot of secrets and a strange vocation. She's an alienist, a mind doctor. She chooses to spend her time with the mad and the bad, armed only with her expert understanding of the human psyche, which today we would call psychiatry or psychotherapy or even neurology. She's forced to find a killer or have a dark chapter of her life exposed. And at the same time, she's got to safeguard the a trio of women around her uh, with whom she shares a complicated history. And while the killer closes in, Georgia, along with the reader, discovers, and this is something that changes her, discovers that sometimes people do monstrous things for all the right reasons. I love, first of all, how you so beautifully put the book in those few sentences, because your book had so many layers. I loved that you explore women and the changing roles of women. And I'm really happy that you just focused on the 1890s, because that really was a turning point that I don't think I focused on until I read your book. The suffragette movement was beginning. The wealth disparities were evident. Women were being able to get divorced. They had different employment opportunities. Why did you pick that period in time? Or did, did, did you want to explore that? Or did you find it as you were exploring? I found it, uh, I found both to answer your question. Uh, I found firstly uh, that the era was just so rich with historical change and that richness very much spoke to our own current time. So uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, the Gilded Age, incredible wealth disparity, the poor um, and the wealthy. Essentially, I think the statistic was 10% of the population owned 75% of the wealth. So of course, I don't have to say that uh, that sounds a little familiar to us today. Uh, these were industrialists, robber barons, railroad barons, who of course made incredible, incredible fortunes. And at the same time, the poor were becoming uh, increasingly exploited. And within that, you started to have the rise of the labor movement, unionism, suffragettes, as you point out, Grace, as well as fear of immigration, 
So their own, I could call it their own fear of a globalization. So a lot of that resonated with me because it resonates with our, our current time. It was called the Gilded Age, and some people refer to our current period, the turn of this last century going into the, the um, 2000, 2010, 15, 20, as our own Gilded Age with these incredible uh, income disparities. And we are, again, questioning um, late-stage capitalism. Uh, we're hearing words like socialism. Uh, unionism again, globalization, immigration, fears, demonization of immigration. So all of that I found really resonant. Um, secondly, status of women. Uh, as you point out, there were great opportunities for women that had not existed before. So uh, divorce laws changing, um, inheritance laws to some degree changing, some educational opportunities opening up for women. At the same time, incredible opportunities for exploitation of women that uh, the Women of Blackman Street explores as well in terms of sex work, domestic work, um, in factories, et cetera, women who could barely keep body and soul together. Is it easier to tell, to tell today's story in a yesterday setting? I'm just wondering that. Yeah, that's a very good question. And I've been asked that before. Why historical novels? Why not just write about these situations that I've just described in our current context? Uh, it's, it's sort of a two or threefold answer to that question. First off, I think we know that history is written by the victors, mostly men, mostly white men. So now is probably the time for uh, women and uh, people of color, people who've been marginalized to take up the baton. It's time for us to pass the microphone or the pen or the keyboard so that we have different viewpoints on what history might have been like had it been written by uh, other people than uh, white men or had um, people been able to say and ask what if, because as an historical novelist, that is what you're asking, what if. And good examples um, that I can come up with off the top of my head, Bridgerton, for instance. That was yes. just a Regency romp, but it was um, colorblind and asked that question, what if? What if we had been able, what if we could remake our past so that racism isn't a center point? The great, about Catherine the Great of Russia, sort of another spin. So I think it's it's important to uh, rewrite history or reinterpret history because it's important to today. And your character is so strong. And yes, she's an heiress, but she also has this very unique um, career, if you will. And I love you talk about how she likes to spend her time with diseased minds, uh, those who are haunted widows, scullery maids, and nervous girls, along with professors and cadavers. Where does she come from for you? Well, a few people have asked me if she was a um, sort of a superwoman in crinoline. Uh, that I had, I had I had made her I'd given her superpowers, but really I never did like crinoline skirts. I'm no, still in a generation where we wore crinoline skirts, <laughs> and I don't think that uh, Georgie Buchanan would like to be in a a crinoline skirt either, though she is in a corset. Um, so she is an amalgam, really, of uh, a lot of real life women. Um, there's many that I could um, mention. Emmeline Pankhurst, of course, suffragette. Ada Lovelace, who was the first uh, computer engineer, who was also Lord Byron's illegitimate daughter. We have Nellie Bly, who was a Famous. journalist, who actually um, faked a persona so she could get into an insane asylum to see what was going on and then write about it as a journalist. We have Florence Nightingale, of course, who revolutionized nursing. We have Madame Curie, two-time Nobel Prize winner in science. 
So these are all women who existed at the same time as Georgia Buchanan. So she's not particularly unusual for her time. She's privileged, but uh, I have given her thoughts and actions that are very much rooted in historical uh, accuracy. And I love where the exact inspiration for her came. You have this um, photograph that magically appears in your life. Tell that story. Yes, a few years back before I started writing The Women of Blackmouth Street, I was in London. My husband had a meeting at an hospital and uh, in London, very one of these hospitals that dated back to the 1700s. His meeting had run over time, so I was waiting and I just wandered around in the you know, beautiful foyer at the front of the, the, the hospital, very historical. Found myself in this narrow hallway and left and right I saw memorabilia from the hospital's past. Manuscripts, photographs, etc. And I, I saw this one photo that just kind of struck me and it was of a woman and I could only see her. She was walking up the stairs, presumably to the entrance of the hospital. And uh, I just saw her in profile. So, you know, chin tipped up, head up. And I thought, I wonder who, who she is. There was just something about her manner, about her demeanor that I found intriguing. And then a year later, I was in Vienna at um, Sigmund Freud's uh, museum office where he practiced psychotherapy for 37 years and it too had um, an area where I could examine manuscripts and uh, all sorts of other paraphernalia that related to his life and believe it or not I saw a very similar photograph of that woman walking up the stairs in profile same tilt of her head and I thought I, yeah, there's something there and I've got to write about it. So really, uh, she became an obsession. And as someone else said to me, she actually stalked me. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> stalk her. I, I love that. And as an author, you just love those things where somebody is tapping at you on the shoulder and say, you must write my story. And you begin to hear those characters in your head. So I wanted to make sure that we talked about that. Your book is very much a psychological thriller, and you carry your author right from the very, very beginning. One of the things I love about a book, and I would say in my own book, I think my own book is has a slow start. But what I really admire in authors are when they have a strong start, and they have me from hello, and they also write as beautifully as you do. Because lots of us have a good story, but not everybody also has the ability to craft words magically. And I actually believe you have an amazing talent in that. So Thank let's you. just take a minute. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, just in, in subtle ways, you talked about uh, when George is talking to an inspector and his purple vest is too tight and he sits and the buttons are stressing mm -hmm. in protest, I think is what you had said. Where does that ability to craft such strong images come from? And do you write and rewrite? Or tell me a little bit about that. I love to rewrite. I really do. The toughest thing for me is to get the first draft down um, for two reasons. Number one, you're always um, second guessing yourself. You're, you're editing while you're just creating that first, you know, molding that first chunk of clay. So for me, the editing is the fun part because that's when I can start playing with words and with images, et cetera. Um, also, I should say that writing is a craft. You can learn it. So for instance, when you say that uh, the inspector's vest is straining, you're actually saying something about his personality. So you're showing rather than telling. So that is an example of craft and that can be learned. And finally, I think reading and reading widely is probably a, a really great tool that any writer, any author can uh, use. I mean, when you read great writing, it just, it influences you. 
and it asks you to raise the bar in your own writing. You think, you know, I want to hit those high notes too. So it's inspiring to read really great writing. I think you're right about that. And I love the way you just phrased that because sometimes when I read really wonderful writing, I say, oh my gosh, I should never pick up the pen again or the sit at the typewriter again because that person did something I don't feel capable of. And I think that we all are capable of that, but it takes that writing and that rewriting. And do you use a focus group at all or how do you get feedback on your writing? Yeah, I, I do not use a focus group uh, until I have at least a good second draft. My poor husband uh, is the only one who gets you know, pulled in <laughs> with the first draft, <laughs> uh, just to make sure that things are logical. And I, you know, I'm not looking for wordsmithing or anything. I just want to make sure that it makes sense. So I have him read very, very rough drafts. But other than that, I wait until uh, my agent and my editor has a look. I have one or two other writer friends that I also ask them to have a look, but only once the manuscript is kind of polished. I do that uh, as well. I have my husband do my first drafts and it's really helpful and he reads them out loud to me as well. So I can hear some of those mistakes that my fingers didn't get. Do you so, find that, Grace, do you read your uh, work aloud? Do you find that helpful? Like when you're alone, just staring at the page? I don't. And you read to yourself, I you don't. Go. He reads my, he reads it aloud to me. Okay. And, and then that's when I hear a voice. But I think that that's a very different process. And I think that that's a really helpful one that I always like to share with other authors that hearing our work. And I, I think it's different too now that audiobooks are so popular because we hear different notes in Good those point. as well. So I just want to read a short bit of the very beginning of The Women of Blackmouth Creek, a street. I always want to say Creek, The Women of Blackmouth <laughs> Street because you had me from the very beginning. You have this doctor who you were talking about and, he, and it says, hysteria. The doctor drew out his syllables from the Greek, hysterikos of the womb, or rather suffering from the womb as the meaning has evolved in our time. He turned, bearded chin tilting to his audience, away from the woman strapped to the metal table beside him. The bowl of the theater pulsed a dazzling white in contrast to the wooden church-like pews where the medical students sat, eyes locked on the creature before them. She could be a corpse, but for the rise and fall of her chest, the sliver of lids over fixed eyes. That says so much in a paragraph and a half about the state of women. It gives us a sense of time and place. How do you know where to start that strongly? And then talk a little bit about how women were treated in these places. The way to start, and this is another writerly trick, usually with your first draft, uh, let's say you get into page 50 or 60, Generally, your novel should start at probably page 20. So the first, the first 20 pages, basically, you're just trying to figure out what it is that you want to say, how you want to say it, the people you, the characters that you want to create. It's almost like you're working it out in your head and then you're writing it down for the first 20 pages. So yeah, in medias res, you know, start in the middle of the action and start with a scene that is compelling and that thematically draws the reader throughout the rest of the book. Because hysteria, that basically is the theme of, of the novel. Uh, it's of the womb, it's of women, it's what motivates women, it's uh, how women are treated based on their biology, their physiology, the uh, social constructs, the, the, you know, the basic, um, boxes that they're put in so that's why i chose that scene i needed that scene to have legs to work throughout the novel as the major um touchstone and it does um one of the things that i'm really struck by in both the interviews that i've listened to and your book 
is it really does have strong female messages. And that's very much a theme for you, isn't it? Lifting yeah. up other women, supporting other women. I'm, remar I'm uh, thinking of, there's a wonderful Instagram group that I follow called Badass Women's Book Club. And if you're I've not there, it, you remember. <laughs> Yes, you, you totally uh, uh, want to be there. It's such a wonderful place to live. And also Lauren Marino's work. She wrote a book uh, that is talking about the women who wrote themselves into history. Why is this such an important topic for you, Thea? I, I find I've had incredible, from a personal level, incredible women friends throughout my life. That is, if I were going to say some of my top sort of five uh, high notes in my life. I've, I've just had this sort of great group around me. And even the publication of this book, uh, they came out just so strongly and supportively and, and in, in small ways and in big ways. So for me, women are, you know, incredibly um, important to me personally in my life. And secondly, I think uh, just from a political standpoint, and now more than ever, We've, we've made great progress, but we have to continue to make progress and ensure that we don't fall behind. And that's why I, I like to emphasize and I like to showcase women in, uh, in my work. It's, I find it very interesting and I also think it's probably really important to show women in all their complexity. So that is probably the second theme of, uh, of the novel. Women are complex. They're not you know, all good. They're not all evil. They're just as powerful as men, if not more powerful. And I, I really enjoy exploring that and seeing what marks. And I'm borrowing from you here, Grace, and the storytellers. I like to see the mark that they leave on the world. Absolutely. And I love that we are complex creatures and that we have this ability to do horrible things in good situations and bad situations as well. Unbelievably, we're almost at the end of our time together. So what would you like our listeners to know? Something quirky about you, something that would intrigue them, perhaps? Well, I have been um, a lifelong supporter of dog rescue. Wonderful. So for me, um, you know, dogs and, and animals are incredibly important and they're very much part of my life and part of my writing life as well and my work life. I've always got my golden retriever. She's actually sitting right there. I've banished her right now <laughs> just for a few minutes. But um, I, I find being able to live with another uh, creature that's maybe not like me is incredibly rewarding and gives me all sorts of insights in terms of nature and compassion and all those good things. And I love that we're more alike than we are ever different. I rescued a golden retriever, so I love that you did as well. <laughs> and Thea, thank you for being a storyteller today and read just such an amazing book, The Women of Blackmouth Street. Um, in the show notes, people can find out where to find out more about you. And thank you everyone for listening today. This has been a copyrighted episode of The Storytellers by Grace Salmon and Authors on the Air, Global Radio Network. Take care. Thank you. That concludes this episode of The Storytellers. I'm so glad you could be part of the story today. I hope you share the stories, tell your own, and come back for another episode. Because when our stories are told, everything changes. I'm Grace Salmon.